sorry for uh, uh, David's condition, but it is what it is. And I might just tell you that my tongue is still a little numb, on one side anyway, so I may have a little difficulty pronouncing some of these words. <clears throat> but I'm, a, I'm an old foreign bar from East Texas. I never could pronounce words anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, you may have noticed that we just had a, an election, presidential election, and uh, banded about in that election was this uh, concept of uh, socialism. At its very essence, socialism has to do with uh, governmental control. But if you haven't noticed, the government controls quite a bit right now. <laughs> Many of you, uh, well, one of the uh, topics was the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, you know, that the Republicans are going to take away the uh, uh, pre-existing conditions, which was a lie, but in politics you can tell lies. It was a lie, it was, that was never going to happen. And one of the fallacies of the, uh, uh, in the Supreme Court decision of the uh, that authorized the constitution, constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act was that it was a tax. You had to buy insurance, you had to gauge in an economic, economic activity, and if you failed to do so, the act itself said there was a penalty, and they said specifically that it was not a tax. Well, that's unconstitutional. So our good friend, Justice John Roberts, Chief Justice John Roberts, came up with a concept that it's a tax. Well, the federal government can tax. It has taxing authority. So just by definitionally, it made the Affordable Care Act constitutional. Nothing else changed. It was just the definition of it. And, if, you know, you realize as well as I do that if you can definitionally call things a tax that's not a tax, you have unlimited power to control about every aspect of anything. There's another case that I'm sure you do not know about, Wickard versus Fieldburn, household term, right? Yeah. You, you all know about Wickard and Fieldburn. It's a United States Supreme Court decision that dramatically increased the power, rectory power of the federal government. And it remains one of the most important and far-reaching cases concerning the New Deal. This, this case came up about 1930, 32, somewhere in that, after FDR assumed power, that had to be 32, it had to be later then. And it set a precedence for an expansive reaching of the U.S. Constitution's Commerce Clause. You know, the federal government has the power to regulate commerce between the states. The goal of the uh, legal challenge was to end the entire federal crop program. You know, during the Depression, nobody had any money, so they couldn't buy crops. So the federal government came up with this great idea of let's just destroy the crops. There's no crops. There's no money. So the price of the crops has to go up. Anyway, the, the uh, purpose of this lawsuit was to have the entire federal crop program declared unconstitutional. There was an Ohio farmer, Roscoe Filburn. It had to be Roscoe. Roscoe Filburn, Filburn was growing wheat to feed animals on his own farm. The U.S. government uh, had established limits on wheat production based on the acreage owned by a farmer to stabilize wheat prices and supplies. You know, this uh, wasn't enough dollars chasing too many goods, so they got rid of the goods, and that would uh, support the price. Philburn grew more than was permitted and was so ordered to pay a penalty. In response, he said that because his wheat was not sold, it could not be regulated as commerce let alone interstate commerce. 
is described, that's described in the Constitution as commerce among several states. The Supreme Court disagreed whether the subject of the regulation in question was production, consumption, or marketing is therefore not material for purposes of deciding the question of federal power before us. That's not surprising. But even if appellee's activity be local, and though it may not be regarded as commerce, it may still, whatever its nature, be reached by Congress if it exerts a substantial economic effect on interstate commerce, and thus, irrespective of whether such effort is what might at some earlier time have been defined as direct or indirect. This is just now one farmer's small acreage. <clears throat> Did he exert a substantial economic <laughs> effect? <laughs> the Supreme Court interpreted the Constitution's Commerce Clause in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which permits the U.S. Congress to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. The court decided that Filburn's wheat growing activities reduced the amount of wheat he would buy for animal feed. Nobody ever said he had any money to buy any anyway. <clears throat> on the open market, which is traded nationally and thus interstate and is therefore within the scope of the Commerce Clause. Although Filburn's relatively small amount of production of more wheat than he was allotted would not affect interstate commerce itself, the cumulative actions of thousands of other farmers like Filburn would become substantial. Therefore, the court decided that the federal government could regulate Filburn's production. There is nothing that the federal government cannot do. Now, as uh, I view things in government in our country, I see things uh, taking place, great changes that are taking place. And indeed, you can see this, indeed, changes have already taken place. Calvin Coolidge, <coughs> bless him, believed the government should be limited and had no constitutional authority to do the things that are taken as granted today. <coughs> now, I think the blame lies squarely with the populace in that they are looking to someone else to assure them of what they consider to be favorable outcomes, or at least to insulate them from the inevitable vagaries of life. Again, as I view things, I think this is an unhealthy attitude on the part of the electorate and will inevitably result in the destruction of our country in, that, in ways that we cannot yet comprehend. <clears throat> but, in my humble opinion, it is coming. For this to happen, it is necessary for individuals to cede more and more power to a centralized human authority, in this case, government. Now, I believe the rapid expansion of civil government is in response to our own desires and appetites. Politicians exist to feed our appetites and themselves as well. But government standing alone cannot be expected to limit itself. As government acquires more and more power to satisfy, satisfy these appetites, it makes more and more demands uh, in resource, on individuals in resources and regulation. If our appetites and desires are unlimited, government's power will continue to expand until such time as its power is unlimited. Unlimited power results in zero personal freedom. Behavior becomes highly regulated. Now, regulating some behavior is not bad at all. We all know that. But in practice, when a humanist government assumes more and more power, it tends to limit good behavior either explicitly or functionally by permitting and promoting greater license to immoral behavior. Anybody ever heard the uh, abortion rights and <laughs> lesbian and gay rights and all that? Immoral behavior. Now the question for us is this, what form of government does God prefer? 
if he has any preference at all. Some basic principles should be kept in mind before considering this question. First, civil government must appeal to some authority to justify its actions. The Apostle Paul said, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. If government does not appeal to God as its authority, then it must appeal to man. This is inescapable. Unfortunately, today, most authorities revered by men are human authorities. In 1907, Supreme Court Justice Charles Evan, Evans Hughes remarked that the Constitution is what the justices say it is. And just think about it a moment. Uh, could someone like Hitler have said anything different? I don't think so. It is easily demonstrated that our founding fathers looked to our God and Creator for their authority and incorporated such thinking into our founding documents in form of government. Second, God is not passive in the affairs of man, including civil government. As was recorded in Daniel 5.21, the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. God declared as much when he set before the Israelites a blessing and a curse, as stated in Deuteronomy 11, chapter, verses 26 and 27, and more fully in Deuteronomy uh, the 30th chapter, 15 through 20. You can read that on your own time. Would we be so foolish to believe that God will long ignore any nation that disregards this warning given to the nation of Israel? Third, looking at the civil component of the law of Moses, we can see that civil law has several rather limited functions. It is to protect its citizens from outside threats. It is to protect its citizens from each other. It is to regulate activities between citizens, whether it be commercial, commercial law or relationships. Finally, it is to accomplish those things that benefit many, but for which it would be difficult to collect from individuals. Infrastructure projects, for example. If these civil functions were true under the law of Moses, and that law worked very well, why would it not be true today? Fourth, all that God does is for the benefit of mankind. We should not view God's punishment or chastisement as merely an end. There is a greater good being accomplished. What was the benefit of the Babylonian captivity? It was certainly punishment predicated or predicted in the blessing curse warning from Moses, but it also purified the remnant of Judah Judah from the sin of idolatry. I doubt that the inhabitants of Jericho saw much benefit in their destruction, but we must remember they had opportunity to live right before God, but did not. Remember Nineveh? In speaking with Abram, God told him that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. That's Genesis 15th chapter verse 16. Did the Amorites have opportunity to live righteously? I think so. This clearly indicates that there is a day of reckoning. God has said so, and this proves him to be faithful. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews said that God chastens us for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. He further states that no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 10 and 11. Fifth, in the same vein, whatever God decides, it is the best for mankind. In the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel, we find that David faced, uh, has faced divine punishment for the sin of numbering the people. God gave him a choice among three. David left the choice to God, knowing that whatever God chose would be the best for all concerned. 
With that in mind, in deciding among choices today, at the very least, we should consider the choices, explicit or implicit, that God has made in past circumstances. <clears throat> now back to the question previously uh, postulated, what form of government does God prefer, if he has any preference at all? Let's look at the example of the city of Babel and its famous tower, or I should say infamous tower, as recorded in the first nine verses of chapter 11 of Genesis. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had, they, they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad on the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of man, uh, men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do, and saw nothing that they pr proposed to do, which uh, uh, will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language that they might not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them uh, abroad from over the face of the earth, and they ceased to build in the city. Therefore, the name is called Babel, which is confusion. Because they had, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Now, it is likely that the one language and one speech was the one used by Noah. Can't prove that, but likely it was. Now, there are certain advantages provided by a homogenous culture and language. Whatever those advantages may be, it is the case here that there was an attempt to concentrate power under one authority. Keep in mind that <clears throat> there was more than one, uh, just a tower here. There's also a city. Although the tower was a central feature of the city and stood as a symbol of the power of Babel. This was a futile attempt to usurp the authority of God. It was intended to frustrate the command of God to Noah to be fruitful and multiply and feel that is replenish the earth. It is clear from verse 6 that the result, if not the goal, of the building of the city and tower was to concentrate power likely under the control of a few. But it is, it is also apparent that the many would have it so. I've always heard that, you know, democratic socialism is not true socialism. But it's still stealing from the people. I don't care if the people voted in. <laughs> As is often the case with mankind, power corrupts and absolutely, absolute power corrupts Absolutely. Perhaps it uh, was a case that having been recently removed from the great flood and in view of the promise of God to never again destroy the world by flood, that the people, people of Babel felt a sense of assurance that God would not frustrate their evil attempt at, at a united grab for power. An important lesson demonstrated here is that man should never presume that God cannot accomplish his purposes because man cannot conceive of any possible way it could be accomplished. Consider the sayings of the psalmist as recorded in Psalms, the second chapter, or the second Psalms, I should say, verses 1 and 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. The nation of Israel was divided into twelve tribes, and so the land was divided. The nation was united under one religious authority and law, but there was no central political authority. In essence, each tribe formed its own state, having a local legislature, let's use our terms, and a distinct jurisprudence. 
One tribe dared not try to infringe upon the jurisdiction of another tribe. Trouble was certain to ensue. Although it is not the case that the United States of America is in any form a new Israel, it is the case that the Constitution of the United States was intended to limit the powers of the central government and to preserve the powers of the several states. To our detriment as a free people, we have strayed far from that original concept. Even before the nation of Israel entered the land of Canaan, there is evidence that a decentralization of power was intended by God. In Exodus, the 18th chapter, verses 21 and 22, we read, Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that, uh, that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. This decentralization of power benefited the nation, providing a more efficient, administration of justice. Although today there are still local administrative controls of those aspects of civil government that affects us daily, centralized government uh, administration and regulation is by degrees encroaching more and more on the foundation of neighborhood rule. Rule at the local level is being bypassed little by little. I may have that wrong. It may be my past great, my great. <laughs> like the tribes of Israel, individual churches are independent of each other, united by their sovereign, Jesus Christ, and a common doctrine, but is in every other respect a nation unto itself. Within the personage of men, it is neither a democracy nor a monarchy a spiritual monarchy, that is. <clears throat> Once elders are appointed, usually by a democratic process in conformity with scriptural qualifications, then in matters of option or expediency, they are to be obeyed and honored, Hebrews 13, chapter verse 17. But they are not monarchs in that they can lord it over the flock. <clears throat> in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 3, we read, the elders among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Now, the benefit of this local governance should be obvious, but it is not to many. Governance of the local congregation by local elders who know the members is a more efficient way to address local issues. Additionally, errors locally in judgment and in doctrine are less likely to spread to other autonomous churches. If under divine mandate, local control is the most effective means of governing a discrete group of people in the church, are we to assume that local control of civil government is somehow uh, ineffective? That certainly is not the case, nor does the historical record of the formation of the American nation support such an idea. The original conception and establishment of the U.S. civil government including federal, state, and local, recognized and gave life to the biblical principle of decentralization of governance. Now, how do we get back to what uh, I believe are the biblical principles of civil government? After all, what we have today in civil, gov civil government did not happen in a vacuum. It was a result of events rather than an original concept First, the church, that is, its members, must faithfully proclaim God's word 
If the nation does not return to a standard of biblical morality, then we are un unlikely to preserve this nation that was, as Abraham Lincoln said, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. George Washington, along with many other founding fathers, believed that the foundation of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. Biblical morality is the absolute foundation for civil government, governance, or for governance in general. Additionally, if civil government is to be limited in scope and reach, then the church, and by extension each member, must be what the Bible says it must be. We must be workers, industrious, self-reliant, and look to the needs of others. Many of the societal functions once performed by local government or the populace are now performed by federal and state government, or at least compelled by the same. When civil government was limited, then those in need looked to the free will charity of people. Or to say it uh, conversely, when those in need looked to the free will charity of people, civil government was limited. When the church does its God-directed work with alacrity and its members give sacrificially, then the state is limited to the functions previously enumerated. However, in those times, such as now, when the church does not faithfully proclaim the word of God, educate the people in the same and practice what they preach, and further, when the members do not give of their means, as the Bible says that they should, then there will be a void in which the state will happily step in the field. It will grow to immense proportions and exact a terrible tribute in the form of wealth and regulation. Freedom will, of consequence, disappear. Then a new birth of freedom in our national life is dependent upon and must await a restoration of the, Bible, of the Bible as the standard and controlling guide in one's life and giving our, our means cheerfully as we have been prospered. Now, I want to allow, I hope these words have had some impact on you, something to consider, but I also want to allow the opportunity for anyone that uh, is in need of uh, making confession of fault or uh, being baptized, putting on Christ, we want to allow that opportunity also. So as we stand and sing, if you have a need in any of those areas, please come forward. <laughs>